Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord tonight, isn't it? Let's stand and uh, greet those around us. If you're visiting, we want to make sure you feel welcome tonight. see you tonight, Jesus. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. We appreciate y'all being here and leading us in worship tonight. It's good to see all of you here. Are you glad to be in God's house tonight? Amen. It's, it's good to be here together with one another. I was having a discussion today at lunch with some of the pastors, and we were talking about the sweetness of just being together and just the fellowship. You cannot duplicate this by just staying at home and watching online. So those of you who may be watching us online right now, you got time to come on in, okay? Uh, we love you, and we're glad that you're tuning in with us as well. So as I highlight just a few things off of the intercessory prayer list, I'll lead us in a word of prayer, and then Brother Don's going to come and preach for us this evening. Uh, most of you know we had a good meal tonight. Those of you who were here, you can sign up for that meal. We appreciate Ron and his help in the kitchen and serving. And so you do that through your central app, or you can call the church office, okay? The tonight was the first night. Things went real well. And please sign up for us so Ron can do just a better job and a good job. He's always doing a good job at uh, knowing how many to expect each evening. That helps us a lot. Uh, on the prayer list, um, Brother Don uh, led in a memorial service for Brother John Goswick, longtime member of Central. And Brother Don shared a little bit about his history with our church. And it made me even feel like I knew him better. But pray for his family. He went on to be with the Lord. And uh, I know he will be missed. So just continue to pray for that family. Jerry Mink has been taken to the hospital through the ER even in the last few hours this evening. Uh, most of you may not know Jerry suffered from a rare form of cancer for many, many years, and he's going through a lot of transitions and medications, and so uh, he's uh, going to have to have a blood transfusion, and just pray for him and Jackie, and then I know that uh, Ray Acreage is scheduled for some surgery tomorrow. So that's just a few names. There's many names on here, and I know some of you may not know those names, but even as I lead us in prayer, pick out a few names and just call out their names silently to the Lord, uh, people, and do what you can to encourage one another, even off of this prayer list in the days to come. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, prayer is not a little thing. It's a big thing. You tell us to pray, you hear our prayers, and Lord, you work through our prayers in ways that we may not even understand until one day we're in your presence. But Father, we pray for these on our prayer list tonight, those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you'll give them comfort and peace and just an awareness of your presence. We pray for these that are in the hospital that we've mentioned and uh, even others that we hadn't mentioned, Lord, that you are aware of on this list that are struggling. And uh, we just pray you would continue uh, just to be with these families and provide them through the medical needs that you've provided. And uh, Lord, just also for the ones who are just struggling mentally, emotionally, and perhaps even spiritually. Lord, we look forward to our pastor's sermon tonight. I pray you will bless the ministry of your word into the lives of your people. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So message 129, as we move from Genesis through the Bible, finds us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. There are 10 verses, and I shall read those as our text this evening. Prior to reading those verses, just a little bit of background about the city of Thessalonica. This book is one of the older of the Pauline writings. It could have been written as early as 50 A.D. and certainly no later than 53 to 55 A.D. It's one of the shortest books, just 79 verses in the five chapters. It is simple. It is clear. It is direct. It is very practical. It talks about conversion and integrity 
and God's word and rewards and suffering and prayer and purity and all chapters of first Thessalonians close with a reminder that Jesus is coming again. It's a marvelous book for devotional purposes and for a study to grow closer to the Lord. If you want to know what's in Paul's head, read the book of Romans. If you want to know what's in his heart, read first and second Thessalonians. He shows his great and amazing love for the people there. In your notes, put down Acts chapter 17, the first nine verses, and when you go back to that po passage, you will find that that's when Paul and Timothy came to Thessalonica. As was his custom, is what it says, he went into the synagogue three Sabbath days in a row and proclaimed that the Jesus who had been crucified had been resurrected and was indeed the Messiah. And Acts chapter 17 says that a large number of Greeks came to know Christ, and even some of the Jewish people who attended the synagogue came to know the Christ. It's a seaport city. It was a very important city. Thessalonica was one of those Romes of its day, meaning that what happened there was seen around the known world. In fact, the uh, Ignatian Way, if you remember your school days, the Ignatian Way led from Thessalonica all the way to Rome. So there were Greeks and Romans and Jews and a number of Orientals in the city of Thessalonica. And so Paul is writing this letter because when those people were saved in that early church, it stirred up the community. It's that passage in the book of Acts that says, these who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And so they were persecuted. And Paul had to leave town. But he writes back to the Thessalonians to let them know of his great love and of his concern for them and to remind them of many things that he taught when he was there with them. The first chapter, we're going to talk about what true conversion really looks like. And I know you may be thinking, my goodness, this is the Wednesday night crowd. If anybody on the church role is a Christian, it's got to be your Wednesday night crowd. So why are you talking about true conversion? Because chapter 1 talks about true conversion. And if we preach the whole counsel of God, we don't leave out what we think is simple and maybe not needed. But if there's just one here who has membership without sonship, who's joined the church without being baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. If there's just one, then it's a worthy endeavor. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction." You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, and you have become imitators of us and of the Lord, for you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come." 
Let's pause for prayer. Father, would you give me clarity, anointing, and spirit leadership that I might declare from your word the word that you want us to hear? And would you be exalted and worshiped in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. So on your handout, I've given you just three little thoughts. The preparation for conversion, verses 4 and 5. The evidence of conversion, 6, 7, and 8. And 9 and 10 is the testimony to conversion. When we begin to look at the preparation for conversion, I want you to see how in each of these thoughts, God comes to us, God works in us, and God works through us. In other words, the gospel will come to you in power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel will work in you to conform you to the image of Jesus, and the gospel will work through you as you become an ambassador for Christ and as you become a witness of the good news of the gospel. If you want to use some other words besides the little outline I gave you, the first thought would be you have received the gospel. The second thought might be the gospel has redirected your life. And the third gospel, and I really like this, you have rung out the gospel. You've hit the symbol. You've made the noise that has been heard around the world that Jesus saves. So he said you've received it, it's redirected you, and it rang out from your soul and your spirit. So when we look at the preparation of the gospel, there are two sides. It is a coin, a singular coin, but it has a heads and a tails. Always the head, the divine side. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You will find that in the book of Ephesians and the book of Romans and dozens of places in the New Testament. Most people like to avoid that word because they don't understand or they misunderstand what that actually means. If you want to use the word election, just be careful how you define it. Because election is not an act of God that sends men to hell. But rather, it's an act of God that rescues men who are already on their road to hell. We have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and missed the mark. Every one of us deserved hell. Every one of us, if receiving justice, would have perished without any hope. This is a reminder that there's a mercy seat. This is a reminder that he came to seek and save that which was lost. This is a reminder that God is in full control. This is certainly a reminder that Jesus didn't die, was buried and raised from the grave, and now sits on the right hand of the Father with his arms crossed, hoping something good happens. This is a reminder that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten Son, that when we are called and chosen unto him, we repent and our life is changed and transformed, and we serve the true and the living God until the day when he calls us home. Salvation is a work of grace. And not one of us, no, not one of us, deserved grace. It is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any of us should boast. The good thing about grace working in me is that it brings about assurance and security. I am not saved because I saved myself. And I am not secure because of the life I live after I am saved. I am saved and secure because chosen in Christ Jesus, the Father has cast his love upon us that we should be justified, that we should be adopted into his royal family, that we should repent and walk in obedience, and that ultimately we should spend eternity in his presence having been glorified. So what's the human side of this coin? The head side is the divine side. There has to be a human side. And here's what it says. The word came to you, not just the word, but the word in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Now, let me tell you this tonight, and and please don't ever forget this. 
This is the inspired, unfall infallible, unerring, uncontroversial, unconflicting word of the eternal God. If I did not believe that, I would be a fool to stand before you and spend my entire life teaching this. I believe this is God-breathed. I believe that the Holy Spirit led men of old to write exactly what needed to be written. And in the original manuscripts, there is no error. There is no conflict. There is nothing there except what God wanted his people to have. However, and this is where you need to listen with both ears, just reading the word is not enough. Even James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer also. But here's what happens. When the word of God goes out from the person of God, the child of God, it is accompanied by the spirit of God to touch the souls of men, the spirit of men, and quicken them and bring them to everlasting life. Read again, the word came to you in power by the Holy Spirit in conviction. We don't even talk about that word in most evangelical churches these days, conviction. What does that mean? Well, somebody would def define it and say, well, that means you're sorry you got caught. No, that's not what that means. It means you are broken not because you got caught, but you are broken because you have broken the heart of the Father. You are broken because you have recognized that in sin and iniquity were you birthed and that it's not gotten better since then. You are broken because you've missed the mark. You are broken because all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord laid on the Son the iniquity of us all. We are broken by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me say that another way. I can stand and read you the Word all night. But until the Holy Spirit accompanies the Word, drives it home to your heart in conviction, you will not receive the Word. I marked three little phrases. The, the gospel came to you so that you became, and then the gospel went from you in Macedonia and Achaia. That's the true work of the gospel. It comes to you by the Holy Spirit and in conviction. Then it works in you, and then it flows from you. So the human side of conversion is the fact that when the Word comes to your heart, it does not come alone. Its companion is the Holy Spirit, and it brings with it great conviction. And I just want to say this, if you've never been convicted, you've never been converted. If you've not repented, you've not been regenerated. You're not saved because you emotionally heard the word. You were saved because you spiritually received the word. Because the engrafted word took up residence in your life. Lazarus is such a good illustration of how God works in the redemptive process. Lazarus was dead. He was bound. He was in a tomb and a stone was rolled in front of the door. If Jesus had not shown up, the bones of Lazarus would have still been there tonight. But the call of God changed everything. And before you lose your mind worrying about being chosen by the Lord, let me just tell you that if Jesus didn't come to us, we couldn't go to him. We're dead. We're such sinners we would have never sought him had he not sought us. He came to seek and to save. And the little boy who said when he was asked to give his testimony, how did you find the Lord? He hit the nail on the head. He said, oh, I, I didn't find him. He found me. And that's what happens when we come to Christ. Regeneration produces the repentance and the faith that we need in the Lord as the Word comes strangely to our hearts. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, and we become the child of God. Let's look at the evidence in conversion. Now, let me tell you something you already know, but most people never think about it. 
this passage of Scripture we're studying tonight was not written to an American audience. You already know that. You just don't ever think about that because we like to take the Bible and say, oh, this is what it was talking about. So the Thessalonians had come together for the gospel's sake, but they were under heavy persecution. You remember what Acts says? These are the people that turned the world upside down, and Rome was not happy that somebody was proclaiming another king besides Caesar. So great suffering and persecution came upon them. So what he says here is threefold. He says, this is the evidence of having received the Lord as your personal Savior. Verse 6, he said, here's the evidence. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers, Macedonia and Achaia. You received the word. They received the word during and while much affliction was upon them. People in America think that somebody laughing at you at school or at work because you're a Christian is great persecution. People in America People in Arkansas, people in Conway have never really seen persecution. There are those tonight who, if they're meeting in homes, endanger their lives by doing so. There are those who have one Bible among many. There are those tonight who know full well when they witness that if they don't win the person and the person turns them in, they'll spend the rest of their lives in a prison cell. We know very little about suffering. This was not written to we Americans who think if you have a headache or somebody laughs at you or you get criticized or you're told not to witness or not to pray that we're under heavy persecution. We don't know heavy persecution. The Romans walked the streets with swords and spears and daggers. And if anyone was thought to be a Christian, they ran them through. Lion's dens. The kings would sit and watch as lions would devour Christians. Children were sewn up in the hides of wild animals, and blood was sprinkled on it, and it was thrown out so that the wild animals could devour someone's children because he would not recant and say, I am not a Christian. So when he says you received the word, he's saying you were pressed to the limit. And it would have been easier for your flesh had you rejected and run. But you received the word in much affliction. Then he says the same thing in verse 7 when he says, not only did you receive the word, he said you people are living the word. You have become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Well, it'd be one thing to receive the word and then just stay as quiet as you possibly could, especially with persecution all around. But he said, not only have you received the word, he said, you people are living the word. Now remember, Thessalonica is a capital city in Greece. And so as a result of that, news spread, like what happens in New York or Los Angeles. News spread quickly like what happened in Rome. And so the news had spread that these people were not only becoming Christians, they were acting Christ-like. And sometimes we think that the term Christian was a real compliment. There go some Christians. That was a criticism in that day, not a compliment. There go people who are acting like that Christ did. Today, if somebody says, well, he's a Christian gentleman, you think of that as a compliment. In that day, it was an accusation not a compliment. So he uses a particular word when he says you became an example. The Greek word there is tupas. And what that implies is clay and something pressed into that clay that makes an indelible mark. I'll show my age. Silly putty. (laughs) On a cartoon page. Anybody remember that? Anybody admit that you remember that? And you pulled it up and you had the stamp that showed it. Well, that's what the word to pass means. 
they have been pressed into Jesus Christ because of affliction and suffering, so much so that they talk like he talked, that they act like he acted, they love like he loved, they walk like he walked. They've been pressed into Jesus, and life was so tough for them that Jesus was all they had. And they stood strong. And they watched their friends drug away to prison. And they watched their friends stabbed to death. And they watched their friends being arrested by the Romans. And they still stood and said, Jesus is Lord. They lived the word. And then he said in verse 8, he said, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth. Some translations say it has ringed out. It's like the hitting of a cymbal. You couldn't miss it. It's a sound that's come from you. When you talk, you sound forth the Word of God. When you uh, share, you sound forth of the Word of God. It's not just to your neighbor. It's all the way through Macedonia and Achaia because your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. What a testimony. What a testimony. I can brag on you for just a moment. I hear all over town and outside of town about Central Church being a good church and the people being friendly and a church being a praying church. And when my mother, when my daddy, when my wife, when my son, I, I asked people to pray and it was a praying church. I, I hear that quite often. It gives me great joy to know that this church has a good name in the community. I hardly ever hear about us when I go to Boston. In the known world of that day, the Thessalonians were known for being people who under the heavy hand of persecution and the hand of suffering had become examples to every person that could be, the gospel could be spread to. What a compliment for a church that Paul would say, we don't have to tell anybody about First Baptist Church of Thessalonica. He said, they've already heard. They've already heard. What a compliment Paul played uh, to them. They've sounded forth. It's rang out. They've sounded forth the truth. All right. Verse 9 and 10. Here is the testimony to conversion. In the past, he says in verse 9, you have turned to God from idols. In the present, he said, now you serve the true and the living God. And for the future, he said, you are waiting on the Son of God to come from heaven. Now, that's a good past, present, and future. In the past, you showed your conversion by turning from idols to serve the true and the living God. So again, I want to say to you, if you claim conversion and you've not turned from the things of this life and the things of this world, you've not truly been converted with biblical conversion. I'm quite sure that many have made a profession that don't really have a possession. Because the Bible is very plain. The Thessalonians worshipped all kinds of gods, pantheistic, many gods. And many of those gods required human sacrifice. And when Paul first spoke in the synagogue and began to talk about Jesus, who was not asking you to die for him, but was asking you to live for him, it was a new message indeed. When they began to talk about a, a God who would die for you so that you could live for him, it was a new message indeed. And so in the past, it says they turned from idols to serve the true and living God. Metanoia, that's the New Testament Greek word. When you turn from idols, it means you repent it. I've shared with you a number of times before, and I'll just quickly tell you again tonight, that repentance was a military term, metanoia. It means the way you were marching, you stopped. And some people think that's all repentance is. You just quit doing bad stuff. But it's not just that. You stop, you do an about face, and you march in the other direction. Metanoia means you were serving idols, now you're serving God. You turned from idols to serve the true and the living God. That's what repentance is. And if you've never turned, 
you've not repented. Repentance brings about a change of attitude, a change of actions. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things become new. In the present, he said, you're serving the true and the living God. They were pleasing God. They were walking in obedience. They were under the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The Word had taken root in their lives. They were more than hearers of the Word. They were doers of the Word. They'd hidden the Word in their heart that they might not sin against the Lord. For them, they had been totally changed and transformed into something else besides what they once were. They were new creatures in Christ. So he said, in the past, you turned to God from idols. And in the present, you serve the true and living God. And um, I'm quite sure in the next couple of weeks, I'll mention this last thought considerably more. But every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reminder that Jesus Christ is coming again. That's why I said it's not all about Paul's head. It's about his heart. It's about the hope of glory in Christ Jesus. He said, you've turned to God from idols. You're serving the true and living God. And he said, the reason for that is because you're waiting on the Son of God to come from heaven. There's your motivation. There's your motivation. It's not that you're going to win a prize here. It's not that you're going to make the headlines here. It's not that the Roman government is all of a sudden going to say everything you're doing is good. It's that you're waiting on the Son of God to come from heaven why would someone endure affliction and suffering and persecution because this world is not our home because whatever happens here is temporary it's minute compared to heaven glory and eternity and what he simply said was that the fundamental motivation for your entire christian experience is that jesus is coming back and he's coming back soon how soon? I wish I knew. I have to believe that the signs of the time point to a soon coming for Christ. But I also have to remember that a hundred years ago, when the Black Plague spread through America, some of them must have thought that this was the signs of the time. So I cannot prophesy, I cannot predict, would not if I could, that Jesus will come today or tomorrow. I certainly will not stand here and tell you that he could not come today or tomorrow. And what I will tell you is you need to turn from idols to serve the true and living God and patiently wait on his son to come back to get us. So let me give you about four things that I think we can summarize this and then, then we'll go. Conversion, number one, conversion is an act of God that's older than you are. In fact, it's so old that it was established in eternity past. Number two, we receive the free gift of the gospel when it's proclaimed because the Holy Spirit delivers the gospel to our lives. Number three, true Biblical conversion is radical. It doesn't just say turn over a new leaf. It says get rid of the book and get you another book. It's life changing. If you have not had radical repentance in your life, you're not truly converted. It's radical. It's a changed life. It's from idols to the true and living God. And last, conversion leads to a life of service and a patient waiting upon the coming of Jesus Christ. So those four things is basically what I've tried to talk to you about tonight. As Paul has said, there's a divine side to your conversion and there's a human side. And what can I remember? Oh, I can't remember eternity past, but I can remember the day the word came to me in power. I can remember the day the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. I can remember the day that I felt the lifeblood of Jesus flow in me. I can remember the first person I ever witnessed to. God was so gracious to let me win one of my best friends to the Lord when I was just a young, young teenager. 
I can remember feeling the guilt of conviction when I had not turned from idols to serve the true and living God. And somewhere along the way, it was pounded into my head that Jesus was coming soon. And I doubt seriously there's been a day since that time that I have not pled with him. Even so, come Lord Jesus. These last two years, it has not been a daily prayer. It has been a constant prayer. Soon and very soon. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this passage. What great comfort. What amazing comfort we have in knowing that you control the universe. Everything in it and everyone in it. And to have been called out by your Holy Spirit. To have been convicted and converted by the power of the gospel. Is a treasure that we cannot quite comprehend. But Lord, you changed us. We were serving self and the things of the flesh. And you have turned us from that to the true and living God. And tonight, Lord, your people wait before you. And I trust every heart in this room is praying, even so, come Lord Jesus. We welcome you. We plead with you. We beseech you. We pray that you will come quickly and receive us under yourself. Nothing in this world belongs to us, but we have a home in heaven. We have loved ones in heaven, and we have a Savior that we long to see. So may it be so. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Blake. I'm the media director here at Central, and I just want to say thank you for joining us online for worship. If this is your first time to connect with us online, I want to encourage you to go to our website, www.conwaycentralchurch.org. Here you can learn more about our church, what we believe, our story, our leadership, and see upcoming events. If you're in the Conway area, we would love to see you here at Central. We worship at 8.30 and 11 a.m. each Sunday morning and at 6.30 p.m. each Wednesday night. We also have ministries for kids, students, college students, and everywhere in between. If you're not in the Conway area, I want to personally encourage you to find a local New Testament church to be plugged into. Want to stay in the know with activities and events and ministries that's going on here at Central? Download the Central app through the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. This is a great knowledge base for everything that happens here at Central. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at Central, and we hope to see you soon.